Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Grand Slam Journey Podcast, where I, together with my guests, discuss various topics related to finding purpose, maximizing our potential, sports, life after sports, and growing our leadership in our next career, such as business and technology. My today's discussion is with the one and only Tiziana Cacciaro. Tiziana is a co-author of the book Power for All, how it really works and why it is everyone's business. If you have been following my podcast, you've probably noticed how much I have fallen in love with the book. And so it has been a real privilege to have this conversation with Professor Tiziana Cacciaro. Tiziana Cacciaro is a professor of organizational behavior and integrative thinking at the Rodman School of Management of the University of Toronto. Her research on organizational networks, professional networking, power dynamics, and change leadership has appeared in top academic journals in management, psychology, and sociology, and has received scientific achievement awards for the Academy of Management. Thinkers50 has recognized Tiziana as one of the 30 thinkers most likely to shape the future of how organizations are managed and led. Her research has been featured in The Economist, The Financial Times, The Washington Post, The New York Times, CNN, CBC, Fortune, and Time magazine. The book Power for All, How It Really Works and Why It Is Everyone's Business, that Tiziana co-authored with Julie Batilana, received the 2022 George Terry Award granted annually by the Academy of Management to the book judged to have made the most outstanding contribution to the global advancement of management knowledge during the previous two years. I decided to split this conversation into two episodes. I believe that the information discussed is very important and that it may be more digestible in this format. This episode discusses how Tiziana found path to academia and how she decided to focus on organizational networks, power dynamic, and change leadership. And obviously, we talk about the book Power for All, how it really works and why it's everyone's business. We talk about the process behind writing it, definition of power, what it is and what it isn't, why power for all and some misconceptions about power. We discuss the need for safety, self-esteem, how it relates to respect, and societal and organizational structures and power dynamics. If you enjoyed this conversation, I want to ask you to please do two things. Share it with someone who you believe may enjoy it as well, and consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcasting platform you use to listen to this episode. And now, enjoy the listen. Hello, Tatiana. Hello. How are you, Clara? I am good. How are you? Happy Wednesday. <laughs> Indeed. Doesn't get any better on a Wednesday, right? It's a middle of the week. There's hope for the end of the week. There's still hope. And yes. <laughs> That the end of the week will come. Yes, indeed. How are you? Oh, good here. It's been a little bit busy January. I can't believe it's February 1st already. But yeah. yes, I think it's uh, fantastic to be speaking with you. Actually, I've been looking forward to this conversation for so long. Obviously, loved your book. <laughs> Sometimes when I love books very much, I apologize if this bothers someone. I underline things and put my stickers in. <laughs> and use them as things to go back to. And I've copy pasted a number of sections to my notes on my computer. So wow. I can refer to them later on. It's been fantastic reading it. Thank you for creating it. I'm so glad you made my day right here, right now. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's wonderful to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Where are you right now, Clara? I am in California. I live in San Jose. I work oh. out of the Cupertino office. So Nice. Although it's still been an interesting coming back to the office. I think it's just 
different than it used to be before the pandemic. Yeah. But yeah. No doubt. Yeah. And it's actually, it's another interesting power topic. Right yeah. there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything can be seen through the lens of what people value, what people need. Yes. And their return to the office is one of those phenomena there Mm -hmm. where if you don't understand what people's desires are you're not going to design it well yes and so yeah it's very interesting from my view the pandemic working from home made us reevaluate even personally what do we value i think being locked at home mostly or most of us not everyone for one and a half or two years i think people reassessed perhaps their priorities that's my personal perspective or what I'm seeing from some of my friends and perhaps myself. And so getting people back to what the situation was before the pandemic, I think it's now difficult because the mindset has shifted. So no doubt I'm with you. I've uh, spoken to this myself exactly in the terms you're describing. So we're aligned. I think it's pretty hard to not see that people have experienced such a different way of living Mm-hmm. And with different gifts, right? That autonomy gives you. Yes. And now giving them up is almost impossible for most people. But anyway, another thing we could talk about, we could talk about all kinds of things. That's a problem yeah. that we could go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> I read your article you shared. I'm not a Netflix subscriber, but I did subscribe a week ago <laughs> and I tried to watch the Netflix tennis series. <laughs> that I haven't watched it actually. Talking to me about yeah, it. everybody's talking about. Have you watched it? Almost watched all of them. I think I have one or two left. Okay. And what do you so, think so far? Great question. <laughs> I think a lot of the things in the Netflix series are true. How players behave and... Mm. <laughs> how it's played or how the players uh, relate to it? I think there's multiple dynamics. And gosh, how do I explain it? So I don't go on a tangent. That's yeah, what I'm trying to figure out. Another um, one, I take you on a yeah, tangent. You know, you're just, you're just, I'm curious. <laughs> I think the one key thing that stood out from the series is that it's very lonely sport mm, in some yeah. ways. Yeah. And we've talked about it with some of my other friends. But when you travel and you're on a tour, you always moving. Yeah. If you're trying to make it up to the top, you always from a tournament to a tournament, you live from a suitcase. You have this wins and losses that get very personal yeah. because it is really your life, your living, your name you're trying to create. And because of that, and you're there mostly alone, obviously you have a team, coaches who support you. The wins and losses may hurt much more I haven't played that much team sports, but I think they may hurt much more as an individual Mm -hmm. because there's nothing to hide behind. Even if you had an injury or there's a wind, you know, bad thing. Sometimes you hear tennis players making excuses, but deep down when you win or lose, you do know that you lost only because of your skill and you won because you perform. And so the run is of sport especially tennis and because there's no filters. Right. Yeah. I think that can be taken very personally. Mm-hmm. But I also now have a little bit of different view on the personal sport after going through college. And so having that college tennis experience that I think made me mature in slightly different way and see the reality of it slightly different. And so that's what I wonder, reflecting even on my own journey, if there is an aspect of that team tennis that I have gone through that I think helped me mature in a different Mm -hmm. way that you don't get on the tour. It's just such an individualistic thing. It sounds about right. Not that I had the experience like you have, but I haven't watched the documentary. But part of it, I think it's as curious as I am. There's an angst to the experience that, uh, I almost don't want to hear about it because I enjoy watching tennis. And if I overlay how much of an emotional, I don't want to say burden mm-hmm. because that sounds, sounds too negative, but you know, it's intense. Mm-hmm. And part of the things that the spectators like me enjoy about tennis is to see the resilience and the focus and the determination mm-hmm. of player alone in the arena with no support. It's you and your opponent. 
and seeing the capacity to rebound mm. from disadvantage. I mean, it's fascinating to the public. But, you know, you start to linger on what it takes out of people, out of the athlete. You go, okay, well, <laughs> it's pretty intense. Mm. I don't know that I want to know too much. You know, I just want to enjoy the moment without emphasizing mm. too much. Anyway. Yeah. But I think it's the nature of the sport. This is obviously told from tennis perspective. We're mostly individualistic species. I still think we try to care about bigger, wider problems. But I think our own problems are always the ones that yeah. seem to be the biggest to yeah. us because they're personal. And so from that perspective in tennis, obviously the game and what they're showing in the series is yeah. going to be the biggest thing to them. But it is equally transferable, I would say, to any other sport. And so now being removed from the sport, gosh, I haven't played in and really competed in 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. I see a slightly different side now than maybe, you know, when I was in the 20s. And so I don't know if that's really that much different than anything else. It's just... It's I mean, life, no? Yeah, in many yes. ways. It's just yes. Life. Yeah. I agree. It's a particular form of it, but very visible, very public, but it's the life. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for indulging me in my curiosities. Great. Thank you. We naturally dove into some of the topics and dynamics of sports. But before we go any deeper, Tiziana, I want to thank you again for being on the podcast. And uh, please introduce yourself to our listeners. My name is Tiziana Casharo. I'm uh, from Italy originally. Uh, that's where I grew up and developed and uh, have taken a path toward North America. When I was in my mid-20s, I left uh, Milan to go to Carnegie Mellon University, where I uh, was um, lucky enough to be in a PhD program that was a super interdisciplinary social science program where every social science was contributing to helping our students look at the world and uh, tackle some questions that are important and complicated and uh, have many perspectives to, to tackle those questions from. And uh, after that, I got a job at Harvard University at Harvard Business School, where I applied some of these ideas to the world of business, but really more broadly to how do we manage organizations where we spend so much of our time and so many of our efforts require us to come together in organized forms to achieve something collectively. And those organizations are very complex and sometimes functional, sometimes dysfunctional. And I was curious to understand what makes them one or the other. And through that understanding, maybe help people achieve things that they, they care about and maybe come together in ways that are productive for everyone. So that was my initial impetus towards studying these things. And then I moved to Toronto 15 years ago. I've been in this really interesting city for 15 years, enjoying all it has to offer. And here I've continued to develop these interests, including primary interest in power and how power helps people achieve what they have at heart and uh, doesn't necessarily just have to be seen through a lens of deviousness and manipulation, which is often how people understand power. It has a bad rap. And part of my mission uh, recently has been to show people that power is energy and uh, is energy can be used for good things or bad things. It's up to you. It's up to us. And my purpose is to empower in the best sense of the word. If you have something that you want to accomplish that you think is valuable, will you have the tools? Will you have the approach? Will you have the perspective, the capabilities to, to pull it off? And so many people don't. And I wanted, with my co-author, the wonderful Julie Batilana, I wanted to support folks that have good aims, have productive and uplifting and energizing goals and equip them with what they need to get there. I love it. That's a fantastic introduction. And I do have to say, when I was reading your book, and obviously you and Julie's book, you both wrote it together, I really felt empowered. 
we all have our own power. We don't often realize it, perhaps. Sometimes we have to sit with ourselves or others to really point out the power that we own. But when we do, we always have choices. And I think sometimes even the simplest of power is to walk away. So there can be power in that alone. That's right. No, it's music to my ears. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say this because you are the perfect person to appreciate what this book can do for you. You know, you have much accomplishment in your life, and but many, many new goals and new things you want to pursue and realizing what resources you can count on. And even if you cannot count on them right now, how to get there, how to access mm -hmm. things of value that you can then put to use, right, toward your ambitions. That's, a, that's yes. essential to all of us. And uh, to hear an athlete of your caliber feel this way, now that you have kind of transitioned to many other interests and many other endeavors, makes me very happy. And I'm sure it will make Julie very happy too if she heard <laughs> it. Thank you. Before we dive too deep into this, and I have so many questions and so curious about what you wrote and your opinions, I'm always curious what drove people to the passion or journey that they follow. So curious, what drove you to academia, this research? Is there a specific person who influenced you or how did you uncover that this will be your career and point of interest? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because I talk to people that are in the phase of life where they're making such decisions all the time. And uh, sometimes I see that they are a little concerned that they don't have total clarity about what they want to do. And they feel inferior or somehow handicapped compared to folks that have such an overwhelming passion that they know exactly what they want to do and off they go and they pursue it with gusto and everything is wonderful. I was not the kind that knew exactly what I was going to do at all. I ended up going to Bocconi University, which is a economics and management university in Milan. Excellent place, wonderful place. But before going there, I contemplated so many different pathways that I could have taken after high school. It really, anything from studying East Asian languages that for some reason fascinated me to all the way to studying industrial chemistry, which was also fascinating to me. So I really was all over the place. And it took trying out what life could be like if I went down those paths to realize that some things did not feel right. They didn't feel completely appropriate for me. But the advice I give to people that face this kind of indecision, like I did at that time, is to put yourself as close as possible to a situation where you can picture yourself in that world. And so when I was contemplating East Asian languages, for instance, I traveled to Venice, where one of the best places where you can study East Asian languages is. And I talked to some of the people there, faculty, students, and I imagined what it would feel like to be there with them and actually do that. And that gave me a visceral reaction that it wasn't for me at the end of the day. I could not get excited when I, I tried to steep myself in that environment. So that is pretty much what happened. I explored options. And this idea of being in, in a school that uh, was more focused on the social sciences did something for me. I enjoy understanding human behavior. I find it endlessly complex and <laughs> wonderful to sort out. And when I started to look at those subjects, if they resonated, the, something happened that was true to my deeper interests. And to this day, I, mean, I don't regret for one second what I chose to do, even though I kind of fell into it, except for some purposeful search that I did to try and get myself as close as possible to what life would be if I went down that path. And that's very revealing to most people. It's what a wonderful um, theorist in my field, Carl Weick, calls enactment. You are not going to know what you want to do until 
you take action, you go there, you swing the bat, and then you get a reaction from what you are interacting with. And that reaction gives you information about how you feel in that context. And that's when you realize where your interests really are. And it was a bit of a discovery Mm -hmm. for me. But what I can give to your listeners and to reassure them is that you don't have to know exactly who you are, who you want to be, and be able to answer the question, 10 years from now, what is the version of Clara you want to have in your head? Well, I don't know. (laughs) I am looking, I'm experimenting. I am trying things out and I'm learning from the information I've received from those attempts, what really interests me. And so that's how I got to to studying these things. I thought I would be a consultant. I thought I would go to a place like McKinsey and be a practice Mm -hmm. management strategy, those things. But then the more I delved into the research on human behavior, basically, and organizations in particular, I just got hooked. And um, I thought that that was too important for most of us to understand because, you know, we do work and live with each other in organized forms, in groups, uh, families, communities, and all of those social uh, aggregations of people are are so important to us for everything we want to do, whether it's a professional goal or a personal goal, that to me, shedding light on how people do in interaction with each other is the secret to a lot of our happiness. And ultimately, that's what I would like to add a little bit to the world, if I can. Ultimately, it would be nice if all of us had the tools and the perspective and the self-view that allows us to add a little happiness to the world. And that can take many, many forms. But each one of us have an obligation to try and find the form that works for us. And mine is to study and understand how people are driven to behave in certain ways. For better or worse, there are reasons that lead people to wage war or make peace, destroy or build. There are reasons. That's what I like to uncover in hopes to build more on the positive side than on the negative. Wow, that's beautiful. I got so many thoughts in my head and thinking about where to take it next, but for the sake of time, because I feel like this topic we could talk for hours. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll And then your think. listeners will yell at you, be like, Clara, <laughs> calm down. If this dude cannot but, do a five-hour <laughs> podcast. <laughs> no, seriously, yeah, I think that's the risk here. But so I left everything you said and 100% resonate. Also, I, th- I think being an athlete, I have to say I've been fortunate that the sport sort of grabbed me and I had very linear path, right? Once you start, it builds up a little bit like what you said, one after another, when you're little, you don't really think that's what you're going to be doing competitively and dedicating your whole life to. But after it ends, then you kind of have to rediscover, right? You, for one reason or another, didn't make it, or you almost have to reinvent yourself and figure out what the next thing is. And I think um, that has been a journey what I call my second career. But going back to the power, and you shared a little bit your interest, but how did you and Julie land it into, we need to write a book about power. It's going to be power for all. And curious, what was the creative process like? And even how did you decide to write it? Yes, it wasn't obvious, actually, because we operate in a part of academia where mostly we write uh, articles in academic journals. Not everybody writes a book, but we had taught around power and influence to our students for many years. And we had encountered so many people that have wonderful ideas, great ambitious goals that literally make the world a better place. Uh, Julie in particular works with social change makers, people that really activists, people that truly want to tackle hard problems that make life really difficult for a lot of people and pour their heart into these things. I encountered a lot of 
middle managers, executives, young MBAs who would like to really make a contribution, but sometimes feel very constrained, almost feel confused by the dynamics around them. They cannot understand why is it that something that on paper is such a good idea doesn't go anywhere, does not get realized because others around you don't like it, don't want it, don't like you, have other ambitions, other goals that are not compatible with yours, at least at first sight. And there are all of these pressures that make it difficult for people to accomplish what we thought were wonderful goals. And so the first impetus for writing the book was to crystallize in one place all the factors that can contribute to making you capable of accomplishing what you have at heart. And the factors range greatly from you as a person, your own confidence, development, capacity for empathy, all of the things that make you effective, all the way to very big dynamics. It can be geopolitical, can be economic, can be global, can be structurally an overlay over your own personal behavior. You have to understand all of these things together. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to navigate your own personal power. Your personal power is always situated in the big picture. And if you don't understand how the two relate, how you develop as a person, and how that is completely intertwined with the context in which you were raised, where you are at this point in time, and how those big macro dynamics shape our behavior greatly, you're not going to be able to navigate power well. So we thought, okay, let's write this book, tackle all of these things. And initially we thought we would do that primarily for people who don't have the power they need to accomplish good things. But then as we were writing it, it became very clear that we also needed to write for people who do have power and have forgotten or never learned how to use it well. Because power does have a dark side. There is no question about it. There is a reason why it has a bad reputation, because it can be corrupting. And the people who have experienced and are experiencing a powerful role in their lives can easily fall into behaviors that are quite detrimental. So we realized that we had to also write for those people to maybe give them, in modest ways, a bit of a power education. What are you going to use it for? Why are you so needy of it? What goes on in yourself and in your context that makes you so incapable of kind of detaching yourself from the lure of power? Those are things that are very different from empowering a young person who wants to accomplish wonderful things for the world and their community and their organization to muster the resources they need to get stuff done. It's a very different proposition, but they're both anchored in the same fundamentals of power, basically. And and we tried in in our book to explain them in a way that people could relate to through stories of folks in very different circumstances, but all facing very typical dilemmas, constraining circumstances, and somehow finding a way out, finding a way forward. Hopefully, that will equip people with what they need to transform their own lives in the same way. Before we dive into conversation and other things, is there anything you want to introduce, Tatiana, for listeners that would be helpful, like Power 101, as you maybe not everyone read the book. I hope this conversation will inspire to read it. What are the basics of power that people should know about? Absolutely. It's a good question because power can be defined in many different ways. So let's narrow it down. We think of power as the capacity to influence the behavior of others. So you have power over somebody if they depend on you for something that they want, something that they value. And when I say depend on you, I mean that they access something they value through you and they don't have many alternatives to you in the sense You control their access to something of value. 
So that is where power comes from in any relationship. It's the control over resources of value. So the first thing you have to understand when you're trying to interact with somebody in a power relationship is to understand what they want, understand what they need, understand what they have at heart, because those are the resources that if you secure control over them, you will be able to influence the behavior of the person in front of you. Now, this influence can take many forms. It can be perfectly benign, where I have something that you want, and because of this potential for exchange and contribution, you end up going along with my initiative, my project, because you value it, right? So there's purely a persuasion process where you see value in interacting with me and make an exchange of resources with me. But the relationship can also be coercive, potentially. I have something you want, and I can dangle this resource as a way to push you into doing something that you wouldn't do otherwise. So it can take positive and negative forms, but the underlying dynamic is always one in which I have to understand what you value, how you're going to get access to it, and vice versa. You have to understand what I value and figure out ways to get access to it. And that can help us negotiate, in a sense, a power relationship that doesn't have to lead to anybody being abused by it. We could potentially both find it beneficial. So one thing that is a misconception around power that maybe we we need to clear for people listening is that we tend to think of power as a win-lose proposition, wherein if you end up having power over me, I automatically lose power over you. But that's not how power works because it's always bi-directional. It's you and me in interaction. And it could very well be that I have some power over you, but you also have power over me. Like take this particular circumstance in which we're in. Now you have a valued resource. You have a podcast with listeners who might be interested in checking out this book that uh, I wrote with so much passion and so much heart for people to read it. So you're giving me something valuable in this moment. So, And I depend on you somewhat because, yes, there are other podcasts, but yours is one that resonates with me particularly because of your experience, because of your past, because of your background and what you're doing. Now, does it mean that I am completely dependent on you and I have to prostrate myself before you because you have power over me in the circumstance? Not at all, because I have some power over you as well. You need good content for your podcast. And uh, let's presume for a second that I can offer it. (laughs) And, And so here we are. We are, as we describe, mutually dependent. And the the mutual dependence can be very productive for people. In fact, it can be more productive than a situation of power imbalance, right? When you have a way more power over me than I have over you. In that case, the dependency is really skewed to my disadvantage. And what we discover through the research in in these domains is that When you have such big asymmetry, the probability that the very powerful person will abuse their power position increases a lot. So you find that, indeed, you have to understand power as situated in a relationship. It's never absolute. It's always relative to somebody else. And you have to understand it as a potentially a win-win proposition, not only a win-lose, such that if we are both kind of having some interest in the resources that the other person can offer, we can together accomplish something better and bigger than if I let you run away with your power and use it to squash me and squeeze me like a lemon. That is often productive for you in the short term, but in the long run, it can become very detrimental. So those are the fundamentals that you have to really uh, grasp because otherwise, you end up falling in some of the big misconceptions about power. One of them is that power is a dirty game Mm -hmm. and therefore you should stay away from it because it's yucky. 
only corrupt people are power hungry. And we have this association of power as something bad. It doesn't have to be. Because if you think of it as mutually beneficial exchanges of resources, then power becomes a wonderful thing, potentially. But we don't see it necessarily that way because we conceive of it as a win-lose proposition. And the other component that people could benefit from understanding is that power is never absolute. You and I right now have some degree of mutual dependence because we have encountered each other. We have decided to come together today and have this conversation. Right now, we need each other to make this a nice, productive exchange. But if we had not come into contact with each other, we would not need each other. And you would have no power over me. I would have no power over you. We are only relative to this moment and this relationship. I can consider myself to have a little bit of influence over you. And you can consider yourself having a little bit of influence over me. But outside of this moment, things can change radically. So people are better off abandoning the idea that somebody is powerful in general and really understanding that power is super relative. It's driven by the context and it can change. And therefore, you can change it. Even when you start in a position of dependence and disadvantage, there are always things you can do to rebalance the power in the relationship. And that's where your empowerment comes from, that there's possibility, there are strategies you can adopt to make your situation better and face the counterpart in that that relationship on better ground. Mm -hmm. One thing that it makes me think about, how do you see related power and respect? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's very interesting. So one of the resources that people value, they read and they aspire to, is esteem. Mm -hmm. To be held in high esteem by others, as well as having self-esteem. So ultimately, when we think about what is it that the person in front of you wants, and therefore, how can I deliver it so that if I deliver it, they're going to be dependent on me to get access to something of value to them. At the most basic level, there are two things that people want, all of us. There's no exception. We want safety, so to be protected from harm. And this is not hard to understand uh, when you look around the world and see the violence, the threats, uh, whether we're talking about war or we're talking about a pandemic, Mm -hmm. there's always danger lurking in the life of humans on this earth. So it's no wonder that down deep inside, one thing that you can get me to influence you for is when I can protect you, when I can give you a sense of safety, you will want to exchange with me because I do something fundamental. The second one that relates to your question about respect is esteem. And self-esteem is the idea that we all need to feel that we are worth something, that we matter for something, that we're not just one of 8 billion people crawling on the earth with no consequence, with no reason for being. We want to feel valuable. And anybody who can make you feel valuable will have potential influence over you because you are very interested in increasing the sense that you are respected and valued by others because then you feel that you're worth something and people give you a degree of importance, think of you as somebody who matters. And that's where respect comes into play. You can gain respect through many things, behaviors that people can see as morally upright, Behavior that people can see as competent, where you succeed, you achieve something that is actually hard to do, that can lead people to respect you and see you as valuable. But you see, it's interesting that gaining respect is both potentially giving you some strength in your position because you are seen as somebody who has 
valuable resources. You know, you're very competent. You have high achievement. You are a virtuous person that has moral authority. Those things can make you look powerful. But remember that you are also dependent on me to give you this respect, right? So anybody whose respect you value, you depend on a little bit because you are so eager for them to give you this resource, which is their appreciation for you, that you will do many things to please them. So this is true for our relationship with our parents, where you want them to appreciate you as a child. And when they withdraw their appreciation, when they withdraw their support of you, you feel it as a child. Sometimes the scars that are left in your psyche when their relationship goes wrong and you don't get the sense of respect and appreciation and value from your parents can stay with you for a really long time. So you see that it goes both ways, right? If you are a person deserving of respect, you may have some level of status in a context and therefore some level of influence. But at the same time, you're also dependent on everybody else around you to confer the respect onto you. And so you're both dependent and powerful at the same time. I love that. And I think you beautifully described what I would say almost some of the ideal dynamics. What I ponder about is if we sometimes give respect to others too freely, and especially in hierarchies, in my view, and I'm actually wondering if this is something you and Julia have observed through your studies and as you teach and lecture about power to thousands of people, obviously, I sometimes find that when we look up and we think about who's up top on the hierarchy, and we think about, oh, this person is successful, we should, in some ways, I don't know if I can use the word trust, but trust and respect them without validating enough, we're actually giving power away too soon without proper validation of who that person is. Because I think sometimes as humans, we tend to attribute success. Let's take Trump, for example, (laughs) as a narcissist type of person. I think nobody would disagree with that at this point. But there's this view of, oh, he's been a successful businessman. And this automatic, why wouldn't he be a great president? Although if you look at people's lives and what they were dealt with, I think it's questionable whether he's really been that successful in business, as some people would claim. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, how do you look at the respect? And in my view, even from my own experience, I actually have personally given respect to freely. So now as I grow through life, I do extra validation of, is this person, no matter what rank they are, are they worthy of my respect? Should I respect them or should I walk away? Right. You capture something very important that is a, a way in which we misunderstand power oftentimes. We tend to extrapolate from some signal that somebody is powerful to other domains in which they may not be. So take the businessman who claims to have done absolutely fabulous when it comes to making a lot of money. Let's assume for a second that it is true that there is success as a business person. And we easily fall in the trap of thinking that that kind of power translates into other domains. And if you did well in your life in that particular domain, you're going to be able to do well in another And that is absolutely incorrect because every time you are capable of exercising influence, you are capable of that influence in that context with the things you know, understand. So suppose you are, in fact, a skilled business person. You understand the logic of business. You understand how the industry in which you work operates. You understand the players in that industry. You have a network of important contacts in that industry. Those are the things that actually make you successful. Those are resources that accrue to you by virtue of being really well-situated in that context. But if I put you in the political arena or I put you in a humanitarian 
endeavor, if I put you in a sports endeavor, you may not have any of those resources that have made you powerful in the context where you achieved. So our misconception here is to think that we can kind of equate context when in fact power is always relative to that environment. So number one, in answer to your question, yes, we should not give the benefit of competence and achievement and success to people just because they succeeded in one environment. And then you can assume that they're going to be powerful in another. That's number one. The second one is a deeper question that I really appreciate your asking. Sometimes they don't deserve the respect at all. They have not, in fact, done anything that really should warrant you putting yourself in a kind of a subordinate position in this hierarchy. And so understanding where their power came from can give you the elements you need to decide whether they're worthy of your esteem. It's the analysis of what allowed that person to gain that position of influence in the first place. Mm. And you cannot answer that question until you understand basic power dynamics, which is what we try to do in this book so that you are equipped to analyze the situation and go, okay, well, I can trace your success and your position to elements that have nothing to do with you. They're just contextual. Being born in a certain family, being raised with certain opportunities, maybe behaving in ways that are morally reprehensible along the way that gave you access to resources, but are not something deserving of esteem, really. So that is something that requires you to understand where power came from in the first place that may really shift your judgment of this person. Yeah. I don't know if that is what you were thinking about. Yes. And the, the other component of it is more a psychological component that we need safety and we need to feel good about ourselves so badly that when we identify somebody as powerful, we tend to bow down to them and hope that they will use their power to protect me and uh, make me feel good about myself. This is something you see politicians do all the time, where they appeal to people by saying, I, and only I, sometimes they would say, I'm the one who will protect you from all these other people that are taking stuff away from you, from all these groups that are interfering with your prosperity and your well-being. And by the way, I am going to be the one who will restore your righteous place on top of the hierarchy of our society because your group is better than these mm-hmm. other people, and I will restore it where it belongs and put the other people who are in your way and are taking stuff away from you down. This is the win-lose logical power that is used all the time to give people what they ultimately want, which is protection from risk, uncertainty, harm, and a sense they are people of value. And the politician does it sometimes very, very well. Unfortunately, it's a very effective way of influencing people to bow down to you. And so you have these folks that with the lure of this protection and uh, restoration of their superiority or maintenance of their superiority in the social hierarchy, they will give this leader a lot of leeway and they will follow them kind of blindly because they want those two resources so badly that they want to believe what this politician is telling them, what this leader is telling them. And then you become very acritical, right? Just because your needs are shaping your perceptions and your capacity for critical thinking. That's the problem. That's why when I hear you say, I've learned that I shouldn't confer respect to people so 
easily. I have to be a little more thoughtful about it. Do they really deserve it? You are doing the work that everybody should do to be critical of claims that these people make about deserving that role, deserving that power, and uh, their intention to use it to favor us. They're often not true. Mm. It's just words that are well-placed with the right audience to make them feel the sense of possibility for themselves when, in fact, sometimes these readers are out to support themselves only, (laughs) not these poor gullible people that believe what they're saying. Contrast this with the leader who says, I can provide this deep sense of value not by helping you put other people down to feel better about yourself, which is the the kind of twisted negative way of doing things. But I will make you feel valuable by showing you the wonderful things you're capable of. We can matter for this world because we are good people. We are generous people. We are creative people. We are innovative people that pursue big, strong goals. Remember Jack Kennedy and the moonshot back in the 60s. He was really making Americans feel special Mm. by saying, we're not going to do this because it's easy. We're going to do this because it's hard. And (laughs) we are special people. Americans are special people. We don't let anything stop us. We shall reach the moon and we'll be the first to get there because we have these capabilities that are wonderful and beautiful and unique and we can accomplish fantastic things. Then I'm lifted up, not necessarily in opposition to some group that is there to be my enemy and my inferior, but because I am special and you're lifting me to this higher level Mm. of humanity, so to speak. So both methods work very well. Both might lead people to confer respect to these people, but you see they're based on very different things. And uh, I applaud anyone who is a little more critical about how these folks arrive to those positions of power and how they're using them. That's the thing that we need to be very careful about. What are they using their power for? Is it a completely selfish exercise? Are they in it for just themselves? Or do they really mean at least a part of what they say when they say that they want to lift other people up too? They want to truly allow people to be their best version of themselves. I mean, they're very different ways. Mm -hmm. And it's often a mix of the two, right? No leader is perfect, perfectly altruistic, perfectly oriented toward making the world a better place. Nobody is completely perfect that way. And nobody's completely evil, even though sometimes with some people, <laughs> you, you end up deciding, well, actually, maybe that, is, yeah. maybe that really is completely evil. But there's always something mm-hmm. that for us to analyze that um, allows us to pay respect to people who might deserve it a little bit more than others. Yeah, ten percent. And your comments made me think so many things again. But even just how we do the critical thinking versus the branding, you know, there's so much push into marketing, and especially Daisy's example again, politics. Somebody's running for a president. They always they have big campaign. They come up with the slogans that fit for people to attract the crowd. They believe they can drive towards to vote for that person, and you know, maybe this is very pessimistic view, but I strongly believe that the person who really wants to run for president (laughs) is typically the one that really wants the power. So you only get very few select people in that bucket. And usually the ones who are perhaps not the most fit for the role are the ones who are selected. Like there's something about the stickiness and the way person presents themselves. And so how do we inspire more people to do this critical thinking instead of looking at the taglines or branding. And also I'm going to tie it to the book, second book I really love. I'm sure you've read the Thinking Fast and Slow. Oh, yes. And really how that system one drives these messages and makes us perceive 
what's reality. It's a big quandary. I have a couple of things to kind of put in perspective. The first one is that you are right uh, that oftentimes the people if who are enjoyed this episode, I want to ask you to power, please do two things exactly. that would help me greatly. One, please consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other podcasting platform that you use to listen to this episode. Two, please share this podcast with a friend who you believe might enjoy it as well. It is a great way to remind someone you care about them by sharing a conversation they might be interested in. Thank you for listening.